Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My name is John Cohen. I am a reporter with Science Magazine, and I've covered HIV AIDS for about 30 years. We have a very distinguished panel, and I'm uh, excited to be moderating this. Uh, we have Dr. Debbie Birch, who's the head of PEPFAR, um, Dr. Sani Aliu, who is the head of the NACA, the National AIDS Commission in Nigeria. We have uh, Diba Karuzaman, who is a leading HIV AIDS researcher in uh, Malaysia and formerly headed the National AIDS Commission. Yeah, is that right? What was it? The The Malaysian AIDS Council. And we have Michelle Kazakhstein, who is United Nations envoy for HIV AIDS for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and formerly headed the Global Fund and formerly headed the ANRS here in France. So we're going to have a discussion about a complicated topic. Um, and it's a question that a lot of people have wrestled with is what, what impact has HIV had on global health, on other diseases? So HIV, starting with the Durban uh, International AIDS meeting, led to an enormous surge in funding. And along with it, other diseases benefited. The Global Fund was started, and PEPFAR came in the wake of the Durban meeting. So basically, the advent of antiretrovirals that worked in, in combination drew a tremendous amount of new money, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also. And so you see this enormous surge in funding. This graphic shows the different donors and how they increased their funding. And so, again, you see giant jumps from all over the place, from countries, from the uh, foundation world, from NGOs. This shows how diseases changed in the same time period. And you can see that several diseases had large jumps in funding. And HIV isn't even the one that has the largest jump, malaria does. Maternal health has big jumps. Child and newborn health has big jumps. I argue, I would argue, that HIV was responsible for these jumps, that without HIV, the Global Fund, I don't believe, would have been formed. Without HIV, PEPFAR wouldn't have been formed. And so I think that HIV did benefit, financially at least, many other diseases. This shows how the Global Fund has dispersed its money, and again, you can see that HIV is in red, and tuberculosis is in blue, and malaria is in yellow. You can see big jumps for all those diseases from the Global Fund. And I just want to emphasize, this is because antiretrovirals worked. That's what I think the spark is for all of this money pouring in. But then there, there have been arguments um, prominently uh, displayed about whether spending for uh, HIV AIDS prevention and treatment comes at the cost of not funding other potential health efforts. This is an argument that has roiled in the United States for years. These are a few articles uh, written by the same person who worked in the White House for a while, um, Zeke Emanuel, a bioethicist. And there have been counter arguments. And this is a recent report from AMFAR that looks at all these spin-off benefits um, to other diseases from HIV. Hepatitis B uh, can be treated with antiretrovirals developed for HIV. Uh, cancer uh, is benefiting from insights that originally came out of basic research with HIV. Um, gene therapy often uses a lentiviral vector that came out of HIV work. Um, autoimmunity is benefiting from CCR5 information that again was discovered with HIV. And there have been improved tests that have branched into many other fields that basically came out of the HIV testing world. And when I first started doing this work, there was no good way to quantify virus. 
the efforts into creating viral load tests have spilled over to all sorts of other viral diseases. Um, excuse me, I went in the wrong direction. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is, this is an argument that... Um, that PEP, this is, these are attempts that try to quantify what benefits PEPFAR really has had. And as, as one of the authors of, these paper, of this paper wrote, that although PEPFAR ushered in a new era of support for HIV programs in Africa, the effect on population health has been associated with uncertainty. So I think that's a curious thing, that given all this funding, and given what I showed you earlier was funding specifically for other diseases, that these are so difficult to prove and to show. Um, last year, I worked with the PBS NewsHour on a program about ending AIDS efforts in different countries. And I'm going to play a short video that uh, came, came from this that talks about a different way HIV affects other diseases. Can we get audio on this? They know the stigma of HIV and AIDS will keep people away. So they don't call this an HIV event. And it isn't just that. They offer testing and care for all sorts of health issues, diabetes, family planning, hypertension, as well as HIV. On this day, they even ran a boat race to attract more fishermen to the event. Six teams of young men competed in a race. The prize? Brand new cell phones. But, of course, you couldn't compete until you got tested. Dr. Craig Cohen is part of the search team, and he says this broader health approach is more appealing for men. I'm going there to make sure that I'm healthy, that my family's healthy, my children are healthy. It provides cover, in a sense. It's not just cover. I mean, these other conditions, malaria is, is super endemic here, depending on the season. It also helps to build up a sense of camaraderie around health, so that people are understanding that the clinic here is here for everyone. Whether you're 70 years old or 50 years old living with diabetes, whether you're 40 years old and living with HIV. Making the tent bigger. Making the tent much bigger and understanding that health is about everyone. HIV is, part, is under that tent. It's not an HIV tent. It's a health tent. So I, I, sh I should have um, properly introduced that. That was about the SEARCH program, which is a study being done in Kenya and Uganda. That's essentially an HIV study, but the way they get hundreds of thousands of people to come out for HIV tests is they wrap it up with all sorts of other disease tests, so on health tests. You're not simply coming to get an HIV test. And in um, Nigeria, there's been a program to encourage pregnant women who are HIV infected to enter care that, again, has the same strategy. It offers the women tests for many other things. And it's that integrated laboratory idea that gets people to come out, and ultimately, they benefit from all these other tests. So I think that HIV has spilled over uh, in ways that are subtle and not always obvious. And finally, I just show this photograph, because this is a book that I um, wrote last year with photographer Malcolm Linton, where we followed people in Tijuana for two years who were either at risk of HIV or living with the virus. And we documented how many people died without ever receiving treatment. So I, I, I wanted to end on this note because though I believe HIV does impact and affect other diseases, there's still a, a long way to go before what's available to help HIV helps people with HIV. There are a lot of places that are struggling to use the tools that exist. And the new UN AIDS report, I think, very dramatically underscores the places in the world that are doing well and the places that are not. So thank you, and now we'll have a discussion about this. We can lose the slides, too. So um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about it? Debbie, you run a program that um, often has to justify itself in front of Congress for, for money. And you have to prove that you have an impact on HIV. But what about the impact on other diseases? Is that something that, that matters to the people who fund PEPFAR? Is it something that you can prove? I think you framed it really nicely, um, starting out with HIV and the increase in funding and are we using all those dollars effectively and ending with, you know, there's still work to be done in HIV. And I think 
I think when PEPFAR started, obviously it was started as an emergency, but I think from the very beginning there was a very deliberative support to the health system. So employing more nurses, doctors, training more nurses and doctors, training community health workers, building laboratory systems, physical infrastructures of clinics, district hospitals, creating space so that pregnant women could be confidentially tested. Now, I was privileged to work in Africa before PEPFAR and Global Fund. Um, if you went into an ANC clinic, there was one consultation room, 50, 50 spots on benches. There wasn't a place to do confidential HIV testing. So a lot of the physical infrastructure, a lot of the human infrastructure, a lot of the databases, the laboratory, PEPFAR deliberately and had to invest in all of those items. And I think what we realize now from Search, which we funded, and Pop Art, and the Botswana Combination Prevention Trial, and from all of the FIAs, that our deliberative strengthening of the health system strengthened the health system in resource-limited settings as it existed. So strengthened the capacity for improvement under five survival, strengthened the capacity in, for pregnant women, um, strengthened the outpatient departments but didn't intentionally strengthen the health system that didn't exist. And I think that really gets to your second, que your real question underneath all of this, is for us to be successful in global health, there has to be a health system that appeals to and is acceptable and open to a 20-year-old woman who's not pregnant, a 25-year-old man who believes he's healthy. And so it's really, we learned from search, but the question is, how do we make search something that is within the health system and not within tents? And I think we think about that all the, all the time. And I, I want to say the ministers of health ha have been so flexible in helping us do focus groups of what people want and then setting up weekend clinics and evening clinics and male nurses and male doctors to really have a space where men can seek consultative health care around their wellness and their ability to thrive in the same way we have done for pregnant women. So I think, I think it's an exciting time because in order for the global health security agenda to work, there has to be that relationship between the laboratory, the physical health care infrastructure, and the community. And if two-thirds of your community is not interacting with the health center, you will miss two-thirds of the global health security events. So I think it's, uh, it's in all of our best interest to really explore those specific issues. I'm curious, on the ground in, um, uh, in Nigeria and in Malaysia, whether you think HIV has helped healthcare in your countries? Well, it's, it's quite an interesting question, John. Um, I've been in Nigeria for about six months. I moved over from Cambridge um, I, in January and um, looking so, at the so health system. So you've systems, lived in both worlds. Yeah, so exactly. And um, I've worked in Nigeria prior to going to, to the UK. Um, I think the HIV, the HIV program has tremendously helped global health overall, but especially in the developing countries. I still remember quite clearly when we used to have um, patients with HIV dying on the wards, and they had completely displaced uh, people with um, hypertension and diabetes, etc. They were occupying the wards, and they were not really getting better. And then suddenly, 20, 30 years later, going back to Nigeria and finding people with HIV who are able to go around, do their normal daily activities, be very productive, it's, it's a huge sea change. And there's absolutely no doubt that the HIV programs have helped in strengthening health systems. So, for instance, if you look at um, the issue of uh, PMTCT, which at the moment Nigeria is not doing very well, but if you also look at the indirect impact of the PMTCT programs, we now have more women accessing um, uh, maternal services. We have more women going to facilities to deliver. We have more women having tests for hemoglobin, like the baby shower that was demonstrated earlier on, which is obviously a, a positive thing. At the same time, we have, uh, when it comes to other aspects like, for instance, the procurement side and the logistics side, the ability to move um, equipment and commodities from one part of the country to the other. We've learned from the HIV systems, from what PEPFAR has been doing and Global Fund. Um, the polio eradication, for instance, which has been going on in the northeast in Nigeria, at the moment we're integrating what we've learned from the HIV experience into the polio program for the last mile. Really? Uh, yeah, we, we, have, we have clinicians, we have people doing HIV tests um, riding in the same helicopters with the polio people 
as they go in, they, they make sure areas are safe, and then they do HIV testing and deliver HIV programs. So uh, there is absolutely no doubt that um, the HIV program has been a bonus to countries like Nigeria, but how do we move forward? We need to move forward by making sure that those programs are integrated into normal health care. What I call normalizing health, health HIV services into routine health care. And um, it's important we do this because we're trying to remove the stigma and discrimination associated with running HIV specific clinics. So in Abuja, for instance, we, we have a program whereby HIV patients are now attending general medical clinics. So you see a patient with diabetes, and then the next one is a HIV patient, and then the next one is somebody else who has something else. So, and I think that's the way to go. As we strengthen health systems, we push HIV into the health sector, we normalize it, and we turn it into just like any other chronic illness, and we remove the stigma, the discrimination, the, the, the issues with disparity, the issue with key populations, et cetera, so that it becomes just like any other disease. Yeah, I think, I think the transportation part of it is an interesting, <laughs> subtle thing that people don't normally think of. What about Malaysia, Diva? What do you yeah, I think um, unlike in the African system, the Malaysian health uh, system has always been reasonably strong, both um, in the hospitals and in public health. So we probably didn't see such an impact. On top of that, our, our HIV prevalence wasn't that high. But where I think uh, HIV has contributed is I think it's opened up the um, health care to non-traditional um, health care workers. So involvement of, of NGOs, involvement of community organizations, which, you know, I think it's, it's going to be very important as we, like developed countries, go, uh, have to face the aging population, for instance, uh, prevalence of diabetes of 20-odd of, of percent, where issues like task shifting and having others uh, involved in care and management is going to be very important. And, and having NGOs at the table to advocate, discuss, uh, demand things. It, it's new to Malaysia, and I think that's a very, very important contribution uh, from HIV. And I think the second thing, of course, is human rights, which um, up until then has always been quite a dirty word, you know, human rights. It's a Western concept, you know. But uh, with, with, uh, with the HIV epidemic particularly affecting key populations, I think it's become more acceptable, become you know, something that, that's discussed uh, quite openly these days. So I think they're the two big contributions um, yeah, that I find. And there's something interesting, too, about things like civil society or human rights where people want metrics. I don't know how you gauge that and prove to your funder that, hey, this is a benefit. Sure, yeah. That's, that's so, Michelle, you're working in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, there are a lot of countries that are struggling, and some of them aren't even getting much outside support. Um, what do you think of in, in that region of the world? Well, in that region of the world, uh, HIV AIDS is still very much an isolated, vertical problem uh, that is taking us something very specific and very far from being integrated in, in any integrated view of health. Um, can I just come back to yeah, of your, your very first question? I'd, I'd like to answer your first question by sort of broadening a bit the debate and then we can come back to Eastern Europe if you wish at one point. Um, I think one of the first things HIV has brought to us is uh, the world understanding how interdependent we are in terms of health. And maybe that's worth reminding at a time when although we're globalizing, we're also more and more nationalistic and individualistic. Um, a second sort of global or higher lesson I see uh, of HIV to health is about governance. I think HIV has also helped us all, physicians, you know, prior to that I was a clinical immunologist dealing with autoimmune disease and prior to that with renal disease. Uh, I've never thought of how political health is and I think HIV has uh, really helped us understand that every decision at all level of governance in health from district to global in New York, how political that is. And we've seen how an enlightened leader can change things and how bad governance can change things. HIV has also introduced new ways of governance, the board of the Global Fund, the CCMs, inclusiveness of groups. 
And then let me, I, I'd like to build up on what Adiba said. Uh, I also think HIV has helped us understand the social determinants of health, the role of inequities, both in terms of economic inequities and, and inequities in human rights. Um, so that's, and you know, we could go on. HIV has brought us huge progress in how we uh, understand access to medicines. Uh, it's HIV that triggered the Pretoria trial. It's HIV that triggered uh, the generic competition. It's HIV somewhere that driven us to the Doha Declaration. And now, uh, you know, 30 years later, uh, we're still stuck and it led us to the high level panel of the Secretary General and we're still asking for transparency in, in the system. So um, what I'm saying is beyond the impact on the ground on other diseases, there are huge lessons. Let me just give one, one, one more that comes to my mind, which is how the benefits of translating very fast uh, the gains in research into programs, which I think has been one of the essential motors of, of progress in, in HIV. So I just wanted to broaden it. Now, um, we can... Yeah, well, no, I, that, I think, I think that that's a fascinating aspect to it that, that, again, has no really good metric. I mean, it would be difficult to prove with numbers the political change. Well, you occurred. look at the history and uh, how things have changed, eh? so, the I, price I, of, of medicines. Yeah, and, it's, and there's strong evidence for that. But I'm, I'm wondering, in countries that aren't uh, really responding strongly, whether that counter-argument that HIV is a drain, that it's not benefiting um, other diseases, do you see that also? Do you see the flip side? I don't see the argument of HIV in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, to be specific. I don't see the argument of HIV draining money from other diseases. I just see a lack, a, a sort of denial of what the epidemic is, of its potential impact. So it's, it's just the opposite. It's treated as any disease. I would like to see some exceptionalism of AIDS <laughs> and of MDR-TB in Eastern Europe. But what Sani was pointing out too in Nigeria where HIV AIDS beds were, you know, being taken up that would have been occupied by people with other yeah. diseases. And that, that is happening in countries that have weak responses. So, I, and I think there is a fair argument to be made that there's a cost that HIV can extract if the response isn't strong. Ab absolutely. Uh, there's the immediate cost and the mid-term and long-term cost. And I think we would all agree here that uh, you know, when we meet decision makers and politicians, one of the hardest things to argue is about the mid and long term benefits uh, beyond the immediate uh, impact. So one of the things that I'm curious about, given that I don't have your jobs, all of you have to ask for money or defend your budgets at some point. Why is it so hard to convince funders of this? Uh, and, and I, and I I know it's hard to convince funders because all of you have faced problems getting the amount of money you think is needed to properly respond. Why, why is, you, you're all making a very strong case that HIV benefits not just people with HIV, but systems and politics and society. Why are funders so hard to convince? I think sometimes that's, we're not used to making good business cases. And I think we, we have really worked on that as a program to really work with ministers of health to be able to make a better business case to ministers of finance. And you can see the minister of health from Botswana who you know, worked in economic development and worked in the other areas can, is very successful in making the business case of investing in people as the country's core strength and that healthy people are healthy communities and healthy countries. And I think she can make a bold and fearless business case. I think we all have to learn how to make that better. And I think you, you hit, on, hit it perfectly when you said, what are the metrics? And I think we had so long been driven by indicators that we really had to move 
to outcomes and impact and show that these dollars, um, American taxpayers in Iowa who are contributing their hard-earned money to a program overseas in Nigeria, they have to be able to see that those dollars, yes, are putting people on life-saving treatment, but also are changing the course of the pandemic and are going to have that kind of impact. And I think we have to learn as a community how to measure those other impacts much better. And I think we've gotten better. And, you know, we talk about the avian flu prevention of that pandemic in Nigeria, utilizing personnel that were trained under the HIV program. We talk about the Ebola outbreaks in DRC and Uganda and the laboratory and the community health workers who find those and, and, and the community relationships that are, that are critical. But we're, we don't make then the counterfactual. We don't go on to say, and if we hadn't, this would have cost Uganda a half a billion dollars or this would have cost the globe four billion dollars. And I think we never present the counterfactuals and that's our fault. We have to do a better job not only showing our impact but what the counterfactuals are, where things would have been if we hadn't made this investment in yeah, HIV. And you, you all went to medical school and I doubt they had a class in any of your medical schools that even told you how to run a medical practice uh, as a business, let alone how to defend a budget. or. What about in Nigeria? What's the, so, why, um, is it a hard case and do you have to sell it? So I remember if, um, if you're dealing with developing countries, you're, you have to look at things in perspective in terms of the, uh, the entire health economy. So if you look at Nigeria, for instance, the health budget, if we were to look at um, the HIV side, three million people, uh, let's assume everybody goes on treatment, it will take about 60 to 70% of the entire Federal Ministry of Health budget for the country. So the way I see it is, if you really want to increase the budget envelope for HIV, you have to overall increase the entire health budget. And um, if you remember from the Abuja Declaration, which went for, um, is it 15% of um, the entire budget going to health? At the moment in Nigeria, it's about 4 to 5%. And it hasn't really gone beyond that, even though it's, um, it's one of the aims of the current uh, political party in power to push health funding to 10%, but that hasn't happened. And, and to me, the best way to argue for increased resources is to keep on making the point that there is no program on earth that's open-ended. The PEFAR program, the Global Fund program, have been able to get up to a million Nigerians on treatment. The government of Nigeria at the moment is contributing to about 60,000 patients on treatment. That's a drop in the ocean compared to how much, how much is being spent by our partners from abroad. But the key point is, that money will not continue to come in. You need to have a new system for funding because these people are already on treatment and they need to continue to be on treatment for life. So where are you going to get the money? And I think fortunately, government, even in Nigeria, they are starting to get around to that sort of thinking. Universal health coverage, especially from the community health insurance side, is probably the most sustainable way of delivering HIV care in Nigeria. But I had journalists asking me, what proof have you got that PEFA will stop funding the program. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I think for us, uh, like in Nigeria, it's a competing demands. And um, again, because our prevalence is relatively low, so it kind of goes down um, the priority list. Having said that, we do get free treatment. We do have free treatment for, for everyone. Where it's difficult is in prevention, prevention um, dollars. And I think, um, sad to say, the issues around key populations and, and the conservatism of, not just in my country, it's my region as a whole, complicates things. Um, and so there's reluctance to, to prevent, to, to put in the, the dollars um, for, for people who are not like us. So uh, as they see it, you know, as the government see it. So that's the hard truth. Um, but for treatment, we're doing okay. Um, I just heard uh, Adiba talk about free treatment. This is also something HIV has brought to us. I mean, the, the fact that unless you have free treatment, you will never reach millions and millions. Um, and uh, it wasn't the case in the early times of the epidemic. I, I remember being in Senegal in 1994 when President, President Wad uh, declared that uh, treatment would be free. 
until then, there was a huge black market. And very interestingly, uh, the NRS at that time was following up, sorry for the digression, the price of the medicines on the uh, vegetable market, yes, um, in, where they were sold, uh, the black market uh, medicines. And it was going up and down depending on the, the overall prices of DDI and AZT, whatever, at that time. And as soon as it became free, there was no more black market. And I, I think this is also a, a, an important concept, but that's just because you talked about free access. Um, I would say, again, talking to, let's say, the Russian Federation and in that region, uh, I would support what uh, Debbie said. And uh, I think one powerful argument can be made with modeling. Um, I, I found politicians somehow sensitive to this is what will happen if, if it's funded at this level, this is what will happen if it's funded at that level, this is funded if we continue business as usual. Um, when it comes to bigger donors, uh, it seems to me that they're not looking so much at whatever progress we'll make in the disease as they look at the big agendas. Yes, the agenda of security, which also Debbie mentioned, the agenda, of the economic agenda, and the economic negative impact of a non-controlled epidemic, um, and also an economic agenda on their own, selling some of their products. Let's not, let's be true, uh, I mean, HIV is also, and, and medicine and health now, is a huge growing market. And hopefully also, you know, they'll be sensitive to the social justice agenda at global level. But I find the, the big donors more sensitive to this broader issues than to actually whether we will reach this or that specific target. That's, that's really fascinating. So there, when, when you're uh, running the global fund and you have to make the pitch to big donors, it's not necessarily even making the case that this is going to improve health specifically or have spillover to the healthcare system, but it's about these bigger issues that are tangentially connected. Uh, I think so, and more and more so. I, I don't know, Debbie, how you feel about this, but uh, um, although, of course, in Congress, when I was coming to Washington to advocate for the Global Fund, I really uh, met with some congressmen who knew every number and who would be extremely keen to see the very specific data. But talking to the Europeans, talking to some of the um, other countries, it's, it's the bigger issue. I think Sonny raised an interesting point too about the sustainability of this. And PEPFAR wants to get out of everywhere, right? That's the grand idea is that you get countries on the right path and they, through their own domestic funding, take over and PEPFAR can fade out so that it's not a permanent program. What happens uh, with the healthcare system if, if indeed there are these benefits that spill over? Are we going to see over time a lot of things start to collapse that have been built up as the funding starts to either shrink or be completely put on the countries? I think, I think what you have to really, and I, we do this now all the time in PEPFAR, you have to find out what things should cost versus what you're spending. And I think governments ask us all the time, is this the most effective way? Is this the most cost effective way? And I think governments and communities are working very closely with us now to really drive, I think, the next big agenda, which is what does wellness and chronic care look like? And I think PEPFAR and Global Fund with communities and countries can drive that agenda because then you are talking about what does wellness look like, getting wellness right, how, sh how frequently do people really need to interact with the health system if they're stable, is it yearly, is it every six months, what kind of laboratories do you really need, how do you get them, and I think these are the big questions that we have, but I didn't want to leave this forum without really, I think our colleagues have really hit on two things that haven't been discussed yet. And I think if we want global health to be effective in all settings, we have to deal with the policy issues that don't often cost government pieces of money, but political capital. And we have to drive that. And we have to say, there's a reason West and West Central Africa has the poorest coverage, because there's fees in the public sector. 
And we have to really look at that. We can say, why is there still an expanding key population epidemic in Eastern Europe and Central Asia? It's as you described. The governments don't see those individuals. They can't see through to the person. They see the risk behavior, not the person. I th so I think part of our job, because if they won't just have HIV, they'll have hepatitis C, they'll have other diseases. So I think it's our job to constantly be pushing this agenda about access and equity and policy changes that are really essential to make these programs work. And until we have that changed in West and West Central Africa, I can't tell you what it costs because it's costing the clients so much out of pocket that it's, it's impossible to really even determine what the cost of care is there. Are, are either of you worried about things going backwards once funding uh, is put on your countries more and more? Well, I think, I think it's something that we have to face inevitably. Um, one of the things, things I'm quite pleased with, especially when it comes to Global Fund, is the increasing emphasis on strengthening health systems, not just looking at disease conditions like HIV or TB or malaria, but actually devoting funds towards strengthening health systems. Because if you can strengthen those health systems and make sure they're able to deliver in a very cost-effective manner, so if you look at the Nigeria epidemic, for instance, Nigeria is a large country, but the economy is quite big. If we were able to push down the cost of delivering HIV care, there is absolutely no reason why the government cannot take over completely. But at the same time, we need to look at those aspects of the health system, look at the maternal side, look at issues to do with, uh, with child health, etc., and make sure that they're all integrated into HIV. I'm quite confident that as donors exit the scene, provided we have a good plan, we have policies in place that are robust enough, we have recognition that yes, with HIV for instance, you cannot deal with the HIV epidemic without sorting out the issue of key populations and making sure they have access to treatment and prevention, etc. I'm sure we will we'll be able to achieve and continue to maintain the, the, uh, the, the good programs that have been introduced in the country. Fortunately for us, we hopefully will not be so affected because a lot of our fundings, uh, domestic fund, uh, we have a small global fund um, uh, for prevention for NSP and et cetera. So um, it's not going to be so acute as in, in many other countries. Um, but I want to get back to the policy thing. I, I think on the good side, um, where HIV has really opened up space is, is in what Michelle I, and I do a lot of is, um, uh, you know, talking about decriminalization of drug use, for instance, which would be unthinkable in Malaysia um, 20 years ago, and, and you know, in, not just in Malaysia, in Myanmar and, so and other the places. So it opened the conversation. So I think that, again, how do you measure that? But um, it's been a very important contribution. Well, we need to wrap up in a moment. I'm just curious if there's anything that we haven't touched on that anyone else wanted to add. Well, just a quick point on the last bit of the conversation. I would also like to say that I wouldn't like to see, you know, uh, the Global Fund or PEPFAR leaving countries as a, a fait accompli. Uh, I would like to argue in favor of vertical funds continuing big because so much can be driven out of it, as we have been discussing today, but also because we have an ongoing epidemic of HIV and TB. And sometimes, I, I, you know, in global health fora or in political fora, I hear everyone concentrating about, okay, let's prepare for the next epidemic outbreak, and we forget that we have huge ongoing epidemics of HIV, TB, multidrug resistant TB. And, uh, and that's a global issue, and it's therefore an issue of global solidarity. It is still a global public good, and that's why we need, in addition to all of the country efforts, a global solidarity effort, which translates into that type of fund. So, John, um, I would like to flip the coin. So, rather than saying what was the impact of HIV, HIV on global health, I think we need to also learn lessons from the way we deal with other disease conditions and how we can apply that to HIV as well. Especially when you look at the polio eradication site in Nigeria, which um, over the years has actually succeeded. Uh, five, ten years ago, there were major issues with polio in Nigeria. N nowadays, people have accepted polio. 
vaccination as a key part of global health. How did they achieve that? It was really by integrating the whole program into the community and making sure that leaders, um, opinion leaders, et cetera, accept it. And I think, in a way, if we can apply that to HIV, apply that to the issue of key populations, trying to get our community leaders engaged, we can actually move forward with HIV. I just want to pick up quickly where you started on expanding uh, the global health piece because part, when we talk about prevention and what we know are our barriers, these are barriers. If tomorrow I could snap my finger and have 100% of girls and boys in high school around the world, we decrease HIV incidence by a third to 50%. So there are other issues that we have to bring to the table and the ministries to have the impact that we want to have. And it has to do with education for girls and boys. It has to do with um, rape as the first sexual exposure of young women, of 14-year-olds, of 15-year-olds, dealing with these structural barriers, these community issues. And I think we are, HIV can drive that conversation with education and with opportunity and these structural pieces because prevention won't work if we don't have the other pieces at the same time. So I think we've learned a lot about the health system that we need. I think now we have to learn what communities we need and what governments need to do to support communities in order to be successful in the end. Well, let's uh, give a warm thank you to the panel. And uh, I'd like to introduce the Minister of Health from Cote d'Ivoire, Raymond goudon Kofi, who is going to um, give an award for the Girls and Investigators Prize. Good afternoon. <coughs> Mesdames et Messieurs, la Côte d'Ivoire se félicite à travers euh, ma modeste personne, de prendre part à cette rencontre de haut niveau en marge de la 9e conférence scientifique de l'International AIDS Society pour défendre une fois encore de cette affection dont la morbidité et la mortalité au niveau mondial, mais particulièrement dans nos pays du Sud, demeurent encore élevées. Toutefois, la tendance évolutive de l'épidémie et l'ensemble des efforts consentis, respectivement par les gouvernements et la communauté internationale, laissent cependant entrevoir un horizon meilleur. Quant à l'atteinte de l'objectif de l'élimination à l'horizon 2030, fixé par l'ONU-SIDA et auquel nous adhérons tous. L'infection à VIH, on n'en parle pas assez, est également une infection chronique dont la gestion au quotidien a eu pour conséquence la modification de certaines pratiques comme la délivrance de l'offre de soins. Depuis l'avènement de l'infection à VIH, des succès notables ont été relevés. Selon l'UNICIDA, en 2016, 19 millions 5 000 personnes vivant avec le VIH ont bénéficié d'un traitement antirétroviral contre 7,7 millions en 2010. Les décès liés au sida ont diminué, quant à eux, de 48% sur la même période. En Côte d'Ivoire, mon pays, les avancées obtenues dans le cadre de la lutte contre l'infection à VIH relèvent certes des avancées scientifiques avec, par exemple, la mise à disposition de médicaments mais aussi d'interventions programmatiques qui visaient à répondre à certains défis comme la mise en place de l'offre des services de prise en charge et l'intégration de ces services VIH au système global de santé. Ainsi donc, les expériences et ou bonnes pratiques à l'origine de ces succès au niveau de la lutte contre l'infection à VIH pourrait être aisément répliqué dans la prévention et la prise en charge des autres maladies chroniques. La stratégie de conseil et dépistage du VIH à l'initiative du prestataire, qui a permis de relever le niveau de connaissance 
du statut sérologique au niveau des populations, mais surtout d'identifier les personnes séropositives pourrait être fort utile face à la menace de santé publique que constituent les hépatites virales de nos jours. Un dépistage actif avec en prime la vaccination permettrait de contenir assez efficacement la progression de cette infection. Cette stratégie est d'ailleurs mise en œuvre au niveau de la PTME où l'association du dépistage du VIH et de la syphilis permet de nous inscrire dans l'élimination de la syphilis congénitale. L'exemple du modèle différencié de soins VIH mis en œuvre dans le cadre du « Tester et traiter tous » pourrait inspirer à améliorer le suivi des patients souffrant de maladies non transmissibles telles que l'hypertension artérielle, le diabète, les cancers, le plus souvent très âgé, diminué physiquement et financièrement. Ces maladies représentent une des grandes menaces de santé publique dans les pays en voie de développement du fait de l'urbanisation, du mode de vie sédentaire et de l'alimentation modifiée des populations. Il s'avère que les activités de prévention et d'amélioration de la qualité de vie des personnes vivant avec le VIH intègrent le dépistage et la prise en charge des maladies non transmissibles. Ces stratégies sont et doivent être appliquées à la population VIH négative, pouvant bénéficier de structures installées dans une approche de santé publique. Aussi, le modèle de prise en charge VIH, basé sur la stratégie de traiter le plus tôt possible à un stade précoce, et dès que le patient peut prendre le traitement, peut et doit s'appliquer aux autres maladies infectieuses en ayant à l'esprit d'éviter les opportunités manquées et de réduire la transmission. Dans les situations où l'accès aux services de laboratoire peut relever d'un luxe, l'utilisation des kits de traitement, comme c'est le cas avec la prise en charge des IST dans le cadre de l'approche syndromique, pourrait être aussi une alternative pour répondre à la mortalité élevée dans certaines zones géographiques de nos pays. Les plateformes de laboratoire mises en place dans le suivi virologique des personnes vivant à VIH doivent servir pour le diagnostic et le suivi des patients souffrant d'hépatite virale B et C. La formation, l'expertise acquise et le renforcement des laboratoires permet aujourd'hui de répondre aux défis des maladies émergentes, aussi en médecine humaine qu'animale. Une source de préoccupation dans le cadre de la prise en charge des personnes vivant avec le VIH. Les derniers chiffres de l'OMS montrent une augmentation de plus de 10% des premières lignes de traitement ARV dans les pays à ressources limitées. Dans ce contexte, le modèle de surveillance sentinelle de la résistance du VIH et du paludisme, ainsi que la riposte avec des alternatives à travers des molécules récentes doivent être appliquées aux autres maladies infectieuses. Mesdames et messieurs, distingués participants, je n'ai évoqué que quelques approches stratégiques éprouvées et mises en œuvre pour répondre à la pandémie du VIH et SIDA. Il en existe bien sûr davantage et il s'agit pour nous de, capitaliser toutes, de toutes les capitaliser et les appliquer dans le large champ de la santé globale pour le bien-être de nos populations. Je vous remercie. Thank you for, Thank you for your attention. Minister is returning. I come again. Excuse me. <laughs> Now, I read for you 
Good afternoon, everybody. And now I have the pleasure for presenting the Women, Girls, and HIV Investigator Prize. As you all know, worldwide women and girls, particularly in resource limited, setting remain vulnerable to HIV infection and accelerate disease progression. A comprehensive HIV response that meets the needs of women and girls require critical evidence and information. The IES and UNAIDS, supported by the international community of women living with HIV AIDS, and the International Center for Research of Women established the Women, Girls, and HIV Investigator Prize to encourage research and resource limited setting that can benefit women and girls affected by the HIV. Today, we would like to honor Dr. Brendan Morn Brown, his study, HIV and HSF2 risks among young women in age disparate partnerships, evidence from KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, revealed important findings that show expanding treatment and combination prevention, including target intervention addressing risks from age disparate sexual patterning, is vital to reducing HIV incidence amongst young women. On behalf of the IES, congratulations, Dr. Morgan Brown, and thank you for your dedication. We wish you continued success in your career. That uh, closes the session. Thank you all for coming.